Now, in our previous lesson, um, we began with the record of the last of the recorders of the book of Genesis. Remember I said different individuals recorded different portions of that book. The last one uh, to record will be Joseph himself. Um, we said that uh, you know, uh, the last portion chronicled his story from a, a young and proud and ambitious uh, man who was resented and nearly killed by his brothers to the point where he was sold into slavery in uh, Egypt as a result of their hatred and jealousy for him. We saw how he was blessed by God with spiritual gifts and through their misuse was separated from his brothers. We always talk about Joseph you know, and how he overcame and persevered. You know, he was in the prison and so on and so forth. But we don't always look at the young Joseph, proud, ambitious, how he was misusing his gifts to try to kind of raise himself up above his brothers and the consequences of that is they hated and resented him and uh, nearly did away with him. So this situation will set the stage for the final episode in the book of Genesis and that will be the setting of the children of Israel, Jacob, in the land of Egypt where eventually they will be enslaved. The next book after Genesis, of course, the book of Exodus, will be the story of God's deliverance of these people to the promised land. But first, before we get to Joseph, we take a small side detour as the narrative shifts from Joseph for just one chapter and gives us a glimpse into the life of the brother through whom the Messiah will come, because the Messiah is not going to come through Joseph's lineage. It's going to come through Judah's lineage. We don't have a lot of information. Isn't it interesting? The one through whom the Messiah comes has very little information about him. So remember we talked about the wide view that you have, the historical view and then the close-up view. So we've had a wide view. Now we're going to have a, another close-up view of a certain individual, uh, uh, Judah. So we have the story of Judah in chapter 38. So let's start reading that. It says, and it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. Judah saw there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. She bore still another son and named him Shelah. And it was at Chezeb that she bore him. So after the incident with Joseph, Judah decides to leave the family compound, if you wish, and kind of strike out on his own. He looks and finds a wife without consulting God, without consulting his father, Jacob. Okay? It's not said that he didn't do it, but there's no mention of him you know, consulting. What does he do? Well, he takes a wife among the Canaanites, something that they weren't supposed to do. So he takes a wife among the Canaanites who was a pagan and as we see by the actions of his sons probably never converted to worshiping Jehovah. So they had three sons, interesting, you know, the Bible gives us so much information with just a few words. Three sons, Ur means watcher, and a little, there's a little typo there, but was named by Judah, a little H missing on Judah. Um, then the next son was Onan, meaning strong, and that child was named by the mother. That's significant, and I'll explain why in a moment. And then Shelah, which means un, uh, doesn't mean uncertain, but it has an uncertain root. We're not sure what that name means, but this son was also named by the mother. Now the significance of the mother naming the last two children is that this suggests that there was a tilting of influence in the home towards the mother since it was normally the father who gave the names. So it means the mother was now you know, more matriarchal in that family than patriarchal. You know, it was the same thing with Jacob whose wives named the children and whose wives had tremendous influence in the home and over Jacob. And so kind of this same kind of situation continues in the next generation with Judah. So let's keep reading. It says, now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. 
Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your, um, for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. So although Judah chose his own wife without help from God or Jacob, he, um, he seems to recognize the folly of this course of action, and so he wants to secure a better arrangement for his own son, his first son. Now we know nothing of Tamar. Uh, the word Tamar, the name Tamar means erect or to stand straight like a palm tree, you know, straight. But her name and the fact that Judah specifically chose her suggests that in the pagan environment, she was nevertheless a woman of character and strength. Now, we see by the fact that Ur is a wicked man that the mother's pagan influence seems to rub off on him. She has influence in the house. He's a godless man, a wicked man. You know, Judah was not a, quote, wicked man. So we see the influence of paganism on this son. Now listen, the messianic line was going to come through Judah and through his sons. And so what does God do? God destroys Ur before he could be part of that genealogy. You know, the fact that he didn't destroy Tamar speaks on her behalf. He destroyed, he destroyed Ur instead of Tamar. So you know, it goes to show you who the, vic, who the wicked one was. So Judah then presses on to Onan, the brother, the responsibility to carry on his elder brother's lineage by marrying his widow. Now this was called leviterate, leviterate, the leviterate regulation. The English word leviterate comes from a Latin word meaning lever, to means brother-in-law, the brother-in-law duty if you wish. So it was an ancient custom to protect land and property rights within families. If a brother died without children, the nearest relative would marry the widow and the first male child born to these two uh, would belong, as far as succession rights are concerned, to the dead relative and carry the dead relative's name so that that dead man his name could continue and his property rights would continue in succession, okay? Um, all other children after that firstborn male would then belong to you know, the, the, that, you know, the brother-in-law that took on his brother's widow. So that was the, Lev the leviterate duty, if you wish. Onan has seen the result of his brother's wickedness, so he goes along with this but in the end, he refuses to produce children for his dead brother. Uh, apparently, he's afraid that he will have to perhaps share some of his property with his brother's child. Whatever the reason, he doesn't you know, fulfill the, uh, the pledge. So he has intercourse, but he interrupts conception. Uh, and of course, for this rebellion, God slays him as well. So, you know. Now an interesting term, the term onan, there's a term called onanism that was popular many years ago, often used to refer to masturbation. And this passage was often used to show that this practice was a sin. So we, you know, people go to this passage here and say, that's onanism, that's a sin, that's where it's, the Bible says no, and so on and so forth. Of course, this passage is not about that. This passage is about obedience to God and the punishment that disobedience brings. That's not what Onan was doing here physically. The Bible actually, I'll make a parenthetical statement, the Bible does not comment directly about the sexual issues of masturbation or birth control or sexual practices within marriage. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about those things specifically. It does, however, give principles that guide human sexuality within the bounds of marriage. For example, in Hebrews chapter 13, 4, the Bible talks about the principle of fidelity in marriage. There must be fidelity in marriage. It doesn't talk about positions or sexual style or anything like that. It talks about husbands and wives need to be faithful to one another within the bounds 
of marriage. It also talks that human sexuality is expressed only within the bounds of marriage. But it doesn't go into any detail about that anywhere in the uh, Bible. Another principle found, mutual respect and cooperation within marriage. Again, within the sexual uh, union in marriage. First Corinthians chapter seven, verses three to seven. Paul says, you know, the man's body doesn't belong to the man, it belongs to his wife. The wife's body doesn't belong to the wife, it belongs to the husband, and both are responsible mutually to uh, uh, provide satisfaction and love for one another. And then the third principle, Christian decency. In 1 Thessalonians chapter four, uh, verse four, where Paul is saying that uh, we must know how to possess our own vessel in decency and honor, there's another principle that talks about human sexuality within marriage and that it should follow the guidelines of decency. We don't do indecent things one uh, to another just because we are married. Now, it's a, the point I'm making here about, this is not a class on marriage or human sexuality, I just took a little sidelight here. It's important that when we try to prove a point using the Bible, we make the point that the Bible makes. That's the point I'm trying to make here. You know, not the point that we want to make using the Bible incorrectly and out of context. So we might want to make a point about uh, practices within human sexuality, but using this particular scripture to make that point is incorrect. Okay? And so there, there's a larger principle. You know, it, it, the Bible does talk about sex, but let's make sure that we line up the passages with the practices that uh, we're talking about. Okay, so back to our story. Let's read verse 11 and 12. It says, then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, remember now, Ur is dead, God killed him. Onan is dead, God killed him, that's two. So Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her uh, father's house. Verse 12, now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers in Timah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. So Tamar, of course, was living in, with Judah. In other words, you know, it was a compound. The family was living there. She was living with Judah and his sons. But to avoid further trouble, he sends her back to her own father. And he promises to send his youngest son to marry her when that son is old enough, but was probably afraid to do so considering what had happened to the other two. I've already lost two sons that God has killed who were married to this woman. Uh, he may be afraid to give the third one and lose the third one as well. In the meantime, Judah's own wife dies. And after a time of mourning, he goes to the shearing of the sheep with his friends. Of course, this suggests he may not have been in terrible grief because shearing time was usually accompanied by a festival and Judah planned to take in the festivities along with his friends. So let's keep reading. It says, it was told to Tamar, behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that you may come in to me? He said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garment. Now, the problem for Tamar was that Judah had originally contracted for her to be in his family in, in order to continue the line. Okay? She had been willing. She had perhaps begun to worship the God of Judah, but was denied her rightful place. 
Her plan was to trick her father-in-law into fulfilling her plan to carry on the family line. Now you know, this may have to do this may have less to do with the desire to carry on the blessing than really the fear of being discarded altogether. You know, my first husband is killed, my second husband is killed, now my father-in-law is denying me the third husband. You know, a woman in those times, there were no other options. So she was a widow, she lived with her parents. No future, no money, no chance to remarry other than in Judah's family, so she was stuck. She was twice widows, as I said, with God killing her husbands, denied the third, very grim prospects. She may have also felt a right to carry the line despite the method she chose. So her disguise is as a temple prostitute, because later on she is referred to as a separated one, which was the term for temple prostitute rather than a common prostitute, there's a difference. Temple prostitutes, common prostitute, not the same thing. Temple prostitution, believe it or not, was a respectable occupation in Canaanite society. Not, not, not among the people of God, however, but within Canaanite society, that was a respectable occupation with many of the women in the village taking turns serving at the temple as their way of making an offering to their own god and goddesses. I know it's strange for us, but sexual activity of various kinds was practiced as a form of worship to many of the pagan gods worshiped by the Canaanites. And so what women were they? Well, the women of the village. They would go and they would serve as temple prostitutes um, um, in the service of their gods. Now, remember, this doesn't excuse the practice, but it gives insight into Tamar's thinking that in her own mind, what she was doing was not for lust or for money, it was actually part of her cultural practices. She was a Canaanite, so this was not so far removed from her uh, experience. Now, Judah, of course, is a whole different story. I mean, he knew better concerning foreign gods and prostitution and fornication. He knew better. Again, notice the same pattern. He didn't seek God. He didn't ask his father to help him find a new wife. He's a widower now. So he allowed the passions, probably stirred up by the festival activities, probably some drinking going on and music and so on and so forth, Add to that his loneliness, makes him vulnerable at this point to make this type of uh, situation or to get involved in this type of situation. Um, so their union produces a child and Judah leaves some of his personal belongings as a promise that he will pay her later on for her services. Now the fact that she returns home confirms that her actions were not motivated by greed or lust but rather by desperation. This woman would do anything to kind of fulfill uh, her need to have a child and to remain in that uh, family. Uh, and, and again, as a parenthetical statement, we see sometimes that weak faith will drive people to do foolish and desperate things rather than trust God for help. And we see that in her. Continuing the story, it says, when Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adullamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand. You know, he wanted his staff back, he wanted his things back, so he sent the, 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 the goat you know, in payment. Um, he didn't find her, it says. He asked the men of her place, saying, where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at Inayin? But they said, there has been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, there has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep them, otherwise we will become a laughing stock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. So despite his weakness, Judah is still a man of his word and he wants to fulfill his agreement. He may be embarrassed about his actions, so he sends his friend to find Tamar, but he doesn't find her. Now the word here, harlot, is the word again for temple prostitute. So let's keep going, verse 24, it says, now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out 
and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law saying, I'm with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not have relations with her again. So Judah is indignant at the news of his daughter-in-law's pregnancy, and he pronounces judgment, let her be burned, you know, wow, pretty stiff punishment there. Uh, she was still under his authority, that's the point. She was still under his authority, denied two husbands, denied the third one that she was promised, and couldn't get out from under his authority. Technically, she was technically engaged to the third son. She was the widow of the other two sons. Um, and he sees this as a disgrace to his family by bringing another man's child into his own family. Now he may have been secretly happy of disposing of her and avoiding the dilemma of his third son having to opt out of marrying her and the problems this would cause the family. You know, I said, wow, this is like a gift here. You know, she's done a bad thing, we get rid of her, boom, boom, boom. Now my third son can go on and get married and we'll find somebody else for him. But then he finds the truth. The truth comes back. You know? Judah shows and actually his recognition, he shows you know, some of the character that God saw in him in order to grant to him the honor of being the line through which the Messiah would come. So what does he do? Well, he mans up. He tells the truth about his involvement with her instead of denial. He confesses the true sin, and the true sin he confesses is not giving his third son, which he was dutifully and legally bound to do so. He had promised it, the law said that he had to do it, so he acknowledges this is where I went wrong, this is, what, this is the sin that I have done. And you know, he, has, he doesn't say it, but, but he admits this is probably what drove this poor woman to do what she's done. He also absolves her of blame and guilt by acknowledging that she was righteous and he was not. Now her methods were deceptive, but she was morally right in claiming what rightfully belonged to her. So he acknowledges that it was his actions that pressured her to act in the way that she did. And you know, he does the right thing by her by not taking her sexually anymore, but acknowledging her children as his own uh, their own proper inheritance and name as the law demanded. So he finally you know, owns up to what he had to do. So his third son didn't provide children for the dead ones, he did. Now that would not have normally happened, but indirectly he does that. So let's finish up, it says in verse 27, it came about at the time she was giving birth that behold there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother came out. Then she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zira. So a short summary describing her twins and the unusual parallel between them and Jacob and Esau's struggle in the generations past, something repeats itself again. Now, we know that both brothers, later on, we know that both brothers, Sheila, um, uh, Judah's remaining son, married and had large families. In other words, the third son, Sheila, uh, uh, he married, he had a large family, and both of the children that Tamar had, they also married and had large families. Later on in the genealogies, the second child, Perez, who appeared second but came out first, was the one who was the ancestor of David through whom came Christ. And so the, the lineage was fulfilled in one way. So this ends you know, the sidelight chapter meant to show how Judah fathered the child that ultimately linked him to the birth of Jesus Christ. 
So in the next lesson, we're going to go back and pick up the story of Joseph and his time in Egypt, which will bring us to the close of the first book in the Bible. A couple of lessons left, we'll tell Joseph's story and so on and so forth. So a couple of you know, lessons that we can draw from this particular episode right here. Lesson number one, children are influenced by both parents, not just one. Judah was short-sighted and underestimated the influence that his wife would have on his family. So you know, the case for marrying a Christian person becomes very important, especially when it comes to children. Boy, those of us who are a little older you know, and then been in the church for a while have seen this over and over again. People are in a hurry to marry and they say, well, you know, he or she, you know, they're not members of the church, but they're kind of believers and you know, we'll bring them around and it's all good and blah, blah, blah. And then you know, that, sometimes that happens. Thank, thanks be to God, sometimes that happens. But sometimes, actually a lot of times, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And there's not a whole lot of wrestling around as far as religion is concerned until there are children. And then when children come along, then religion becomes very, very important because it's, a, it's an important issue. And you know, people kind of struggle on that. So it's, it's important. Fortunately, Young people many times don't see that far ahead. They only consider the existing relationship and not how the relationship is going to exist in the future. So that's why it's important you know, not only to encourage our young people to marry other Christians, obviously, but in the event that they don't, parents need to help provide Christian influence in their grandchildren's lives uh, that might be missing because of the disbelief of one of the parents or, or both. Note, I want you to note that Jacob's name is not mentioned one time in this chapter. Through the entire, all of the things that happened, Judah's father, Jacob, is not mentioned. He, he doesn't go to him for help, he doesn't include him. The grandfather, not involved whatsoever in the life of his grandchildren. And I'm looking around, a lot of people here are grandparents, so I'm preaching to the choir. I know that you know how important it is. You know, even when both you know, your child and, and your child's spouse both are faithful Christians, they still need support. They still need spiritual support and encouragement you know, uh, from, from grandparents. All right, number two, lesson number two. God can cause all things to work for good. We always you know, that passage in Romans, you know, God causes all things to work for good. You know, we, we, we put the emphasis on good, but the emphasis should be on all, all things to work for good. Now I mentioned in the last lesson, but it bears repeating. God chose Judah to carry the line. He had poor judgment and many weaknesses. Uh, his wicked and rebellious sons were killed. He had a pagan wife. Tamar's helplessness and her deceptive plan and her seduction of him, all of that mess in his life. And yet God managed to cause all of these negative things to work together to achieve God's own goals. I mean, the wicked will still be judged and the weak will still suffer the consequences of their mistakes but God's plan will not be thwarted even by our own poor judgment and mistakes. So you know, this should give us confidence to go ahead when we're not sure. How many times we say, God, just tell me what I need to do. You know, do I go left or right, up or down? Do I stay or go? You know, just let me know which way I should go and we don't know. And we just have to make a choice. And we don't always make the right choice or to persevere even when we make mistakes. You know, we want to do everything perfect and if we don't, sometimes we just want to quit, it's not worth doing. Or to maintain our hope of salvation even when the evidence around us points to the conclusion that we're not going to make it. God's plan is to bring the faithful to heaven and He will accomplish that plan no matter what. No matter what, despite our mistakes and weaknesses, He will accomplish accomplish his plan. So you know, if you're serving the Lord, whatever you're doing, just do it with all your might. You know? He can cause, he, he can bring everything together and make his purpose, uh, um, achieve his purpose in the end. And then maybe another lesson obvious, it's not who you are, it's who God makes you. 
It's interesting to note that in the genealogy of Jesus, only four women are mentioned. When you look at the genealogy, it's always the son of, the son of this man, the son of that man. Da, da, da. Only four women are mentioned in the genealogy of, of Jesus. Now listen to the four women. There's Tamar, a Canaanite woman who tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her. The next woman, Rahab, a prostitute who hid Jewish spies. Ruth, a Moabitess who persuaded Boaz to marry her after sleeping near him while he was drunk. And Bathsheba, the Hittite woman who committed adultery with David. These are the four women that are mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. There were many other women mentioned in the Bible who were noble and brave and smart and so on and so forth. They're not mentioned. These four women are mentioned. None of these women were Jews. All came into the Messianic line under dubious circumstances, but all of them were transformed by their contact with the men who believed in God. So listen, Tamar clung to the promise of Judah to belong to the Israelite nation through marriage and childbearing, and eventually she, she what? He absolved her. He said, you're not guilty, I'm guilty. You're getting what, you, what I promised you by the law. So he absolved her of, of whatever she did and she got what she deserved to get. Rahab left prostitution and she married Salmon after the Jews captured Jericho. And she became the great grandmother of David. <laughs> and Ruth, followed her mother-in-law Naomi and adopted Naomi's faith, which led her to Boaz and her marriage with him. I would say um, uh, Rahab is further back than great-grandmother, I'm sorry. I'm talking about Ruth here. And then Bathsheba, come on, committed adultery, had an illegitimate child. But Bathsheba became the key influence in making sure that Solomon, her child, became king after David, thus ensuring the unity of Israel at that time. All four women had drastic changes in their life and God used them in dynamic ways to make sure that the line would continue. So God took these women who were pagans and because of their conversion and faith, He used them in a mighty way to preserve the lineage through which Jesus came. So what am I saying? Well, there's hope for those who have unbelieving partners. There's hope for those who have questionable backgrounds because God can make valuable servants out of anybody, regardless of their past, and give everyone a glorious future. And I think these women here are proof of that. We don't always use these women, right? We use Deborah, we use Esther, we use Mary, we use Martha. You know? We don't use these women, but God used these women. God used these women. Terrific, terrific story, a great story of encouragement. Because you know? we're always talking about guys and all the bad things they did and then they were converted. But these women, you know, they came from way far back and God managed to use them in a mighty way. Okay, that's our lesson. We move on to Joseph. We're in the home stretch. <laughs> <laughs>